Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never season your grace has been enough and I'm believing that the best is yet to come the cross before me my hope on things above and in you Jesus the best is yet to come Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before.
how far we've come All we've been through Every breakthrough It was you Only you Every failure Every open door You knew just what you had in store Oh, we've been through Every breakthrough It was you Only you I've always had a hope and a future There's never been a doubt in your mind Even when I cannot see it You are the author You are the finisher My story, every single word. You stay with me in the deepest hurt. All we've been through, every breakthrough, it was you, only you. I've always had a hope and a future. Never been a doubt in your mind Even when I cannot see it You are the author I've always had a hope and a future There's never been a doubt in your mind Even when I cannot see it You are the author You are the finisher Well, good morning to our Generations Church family, and welcome to day 16 of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, you're in the home stretch, you're in the final week, and uh, I pray and hope that you will uh, continue to push in, just lean in to all that God has for us in this final week. Uh, I also appreciate your flexibility to join us online today. Uh, I'm actually recording this on Sunday night, so if I reference tonight at any point, just act like I said today or this morning. I'm not not sending this to you live, but um, it's been a rough 24 hours for our church family, and uh, I, I hate to cancel in-person gatherings. We, we had to do that on Sunday morning just in anticipation of weather, and also again for Monday morning. We believe it to be the wisest thing to do in a situation like this, and so I appreciate you being a part of this, but and what a journey we've been on as a church family the last 24 hours. If you're not aware, uh, on Saturday evening, a uh, member of our church, Brianna Lee, who also happens to be uh, Pastor Aaron's sister. Pastor Aaron is our youth pastor and 
Richard and Pam White, who are elders at our church, uh, and she was the wife of Jesse. They attend William's mom, Amelia's mom, uh, 25 years old. She was experiencing a pretty severe headache on Saturday, and um, they eventually, after they couldn't get the pain to subside, they eventually rushed her to the emergency room, and uh, then her family was called in a few hours later. Uh, she was going to be rushed back for an emergency brain surgery, but before that ever took place, uh, she experienced some great trauma, and uh, really, there wasn't a great doctor's report from the late hours of Saturday evening into Sunday morning. And so we received a call. We rushed to the hospital to be with the family. And uh, we spent uh, the late hours of Saturday night into early Sunday morning uh, praying and asking God for a miracle. And ultimately, early on Sunday morning, uh, Brianna uh, was no longer a citizen of earth, that she was taken uh, from this life and uh, man what a tragic event uh, for this family and for our church family for those that knew her and uh, man it's just uh, there's no words at a time like this I was talking to Richard just a little while ago and you know I said nobody knows what to say we, we don't know what to say uh, we don't know what to do we want to help but we don't know what to do and uh, I remember as a younger boy uh, early in my life hearing a man a much older wiser man say that the human heart has never learned how to deal with death. It's just something we can't grasp. We can't comprehend. It doesn't really matter if, if someone's lived a long and full life. It still breaks our heart, their, their, their loss to us. But especially in a situation like this, someone so young, something so sudden where it was unexpected, man, it, it leaves us with a lot of questions and uh, leaves us with a lot of emotion. And uh, I remember almost 11 years ago now when my mom passed away uh, after a two-year battle of cancer, uh, people saying, you know, she received her ultimate healing. And I believe that. I do believe that. But but ultimately, that's not what I was praying for. I was praying for her healing here on the earth. I wanted the cancer to, to, to go away, and I wanted her to be restored to full health. And that's what we were praying last night for Brianna. We were praying for God to heal her body. We were praying for the doctor's reports to be laid aside and the report of the great physician to, to rule over the circumstances that she was experiencing in her body. We were praying for the supernatural. And, uh, and we didn't receive the answer that we had hoped for. And, uh, and so I couldn't help but think all night long and even through the day today as we've been with the family about this month-long theme we've had about miracles. We've been talking about them. We've been reading about them. We've been praying about them. And we were seeking a miracle last night, and we didn't get the miracle that we hoped for. So what do you do in a situation like that? What do you do when the prayers aren't answered like you hope? What do you do when you're asking God to intervene and do the miraculous and it just doesn't turn out the way that you hoped? Well, I think this is, I'm painting with a very broad brush here, but I think there's really two groups of people in how we initially respond when bad things happen. And I don't use that term lightly. I don't use that to minimize anything that has happened or anything that may have happened in your life or will happen. But when bad things happen, we normally respond in one of two ways. We linger in the why. Now, there is nothing wrong with asking a why question. I've watched that with this family in the last 24 hours. I've asked those questions so many different times in my life. God, why is this happening? I cannot make sense of what's happening right now. And so there's no problem with asking why. Uh, but if we linger there and we never move to that second phase, and there are some people that don't don't land there early enough. You know, Dr. Amy Hollings had told us a few weeks ago in our service that we should feel what we feel. And that comes in that questioning phase and the grieving and emotion-filled phase that we have. Uh, but then there's also another phase that's the what now phase. Like, where do we go from here? And I don't think we move to that too quickly. I, I don't think that the events of the last 24 hours, we should really even be there much at all. But, but eventually, when we experience trauma, heartache, crisis, eventually we have to shift our mindset to where do we go from here? What is next? And so as we think about those two groups of people and those two responses uh, to bad things, I was reminded of several themes in scripture. This is not an exhaustive list, but as we look to these kind of why questions, first of all, why do bad things happen? Well, I think that there are primarily three places, three things that we see that you could put almost all of those bad things in. The first of those is judgment. 
judgment. So one example of this would be Genesis chapter 6 with Noah and the ark and the flood that came to really pour out a punishment on the earth for the wickedness that existed. We see the prophets over and over in the Old Testament specifically, and even Jesus prophesying about the judgment that was to come, the ultimate judgment that we still believe is to come, that judgment had to come because God is a holy and just God. And so God sent the rainbow at the end of the flood in Genesis 6, and he promised never to pour out that kind of punishment or judgment again until he does it ultimately. But we do believe that there are times that some bad things have happened because God is judging or punishing. We also see some other examples uh, where bad things happen as a result of the consequences of our actions. One of the examples that I point to a good bit as I read through scripture is the place where King David has an affair with Bathsheba. And the child that is born out of that adulterous affair, uh, that child dies. And the prophets come and confronted David in his sin. But that's ultimately a consequence for his behavior. Again, the prophets of the Old Testament, not just the prophets of the Old Testament. We see Paul talking about it as he challenges and writes some of the churches in the New Testament epistles. That there are consequences for the decisions that we make, the behaviors of our lives. And so sometimes bad things happen as a result of our own Behavior. Now, I would not say that what we've experienced in the last 24 hours is really in either of these camps, but those are some of the reasons that things happen the way that they do. But there is a third, I'm, I'm kind of dumping everything into a larger bucket here, and maybe you could kind of split this out and parse this out a little bit, but I would say potentially some of these other things would be tests, tests or trials, where when we walk through things that we never would have chosen for ourselves, we recognize that maybe somehow, in some way, there could be some good that comes from this. And ultimately, we don't understand all of how that plays out. The story of Job is a story that a lot of times we go to from the Old Testament text. And we, we never want to just go there as the cliche response to bad things that we don't understand. But there are some lessons from the story of Job in that we are privy to a conversation in the heavenlies that Job is never privy to. He, he never gets access to why these things are taking place. You and I see some conversations that really bring some of that action. Job never gets that. And so there are times in our lives when things happen and we don't really understand fully the why. But James chapter one, verses two through four says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We don't like to go through tests and trials. We, we usually don't seek them, but if we recognize that in the midst of some things that we would never have chosen for ourselves, that God could do a work in us, that God could accomplish something, he could complete a work in us, it does cause us to be able to reframe it a little bit. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 28 uh, says that God can work all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And so we recognize there is a context for that statement, but we do know that God can work together and restore and redeem things that you and I cannot do. That sometimes when bad things happen and circumstances are happening in our life that we can't, we can't understand in any way how this might turn out for any good whatsoever. And I promise you, I've had that thought and that feeling in the last 24 hours. I also believe that God is a God who can do something beyond my limited human understanding and so I have been praying, God, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But God, in some way, within your sovereignty and your grace, would you redeem this for your glory, but ultimately for the restoration of some of the brokenness that this family has experienced? And so we think about these types of things. And man, I just got to tell you, the family that, that we're talking about here, they have been such a testimony of, of God's grace towards them. And they've just been a model of faithfulness as we've stood with them in hospital rooms and hallways as they've prayed and cried out to God and pleaded and begged of him to, to do the miraculous. They have done so with such an incredible competence. But even after uh, Brianna's passing, even though they have walked through the various emotional highs and lows of the first day of this experience, man, even then they have clung to hope. Have they cried? Absolutely. And they should. Have they been angry? Absolutely, and they should. Have they questioned aloud, God, why in the world did this happen? This makes no sense to us. Absolutely, and they should. And let me just remind us of a couple of things. One, God is not intimidated by our questions. 
God is not intimidated by our questions. His own son, Jesus, on the cross cried out and said, God, why, are you, why have you forsaken me? Like, there's a question here. Like, I don't understand what you're trying to do. And in his humanness, that was a great question because it, it helped us to recognize we're not alone in that, in his humanity. But in his deity, as that 100% God, we also recognize that he, he had access to the plan, the sovereign plan of God. And yet he said, God, why have you forsaken? God's not intimidated by your questions, by our questions. The other thing is God is not intimidated by our emotions. Again, we see in the Psalms, man, this unbelievable highs and lows, the emotions, the questioning of God and the, where are you at? And God, I'm not sure what you're accomplishing. And God, I praise you because you're amazing. And then Lord, I hope you just smite me in my whole life. Cause I, I mean, it's this, it's this unbelievable picture of human emotion. And I believe that according to Psalm 139, God knit us together and we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's not just our physical beings. He, he did knit us together, our arms and our torso and our legs, and he put us all together. But I also believe he knit us with emotion and he gave those emotions to us. And we can actually use our emotions to respond to the human experience and, and use those in worship and praise to God. And so God's not intimidated by our emotions. And this family has walked through this journey of just the first day and they've experienced just about every emotion that you possibly can. But at the same time, they have prayed these kinds of prayers with faith-filled conviction. God, we don't know why this is happening. God, God, we don't understand what's going on. But God, we know that you can be trusted. I've heard them pray that prayer. God, we know that somehow you can restore. You can do a work. What a, what a faith-filled moment of being able to say that in the midst of what they have walked through. And so I just want to remind all of us of some of that what now. We've got the why. We should all ask those questions and lean into those questions and feel what we feel and, and, and be there in that moment, be present. But I also think we should allow ourselves to move beyond that at some point, not too quickly, into the what now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 say this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. We do not grieve like those who have no hope. I heard Richard, Brianna's father, I heard Richard say tonight, Sunday evening, man, I, I, I hate what we're walking through. And I, I've experienced every kind of emotion possible, but he said, I cannot imagine walking through this without the hope of Jesus Christ, that one day we'll be reunited together in heaven. And uh, man, what a, what a true statement. We can cry, we can yell, we can grieve, we can question aloud, but we cling to hope. That is the picture of faith. And so for those of us in that what now group, for those of us that eventually make our way in the midst of heartache and tragedy and brokenness, we cling to hope, we cling to faith, and we're reminded of the words of scripture that tells us in Matthew chapter five, verse four, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. When you mourn, which is your right to do so, God-given right, he says it's gonna happen. And when you do, just know there's a response from the heavenlies that you're gonna be comforted. We also read in Psalm 34, verse 18, it says that God is near to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The contemporary English version says the Lord is there to rescue all who are discouraged and have given up hope. If you are discouraged, if you are brokenhearted, if your spirit is crushed, God is near to you. He, he may never be more near to you than in those moments. And so we cling to that. We long that God's presence would be with us because we don't want to have to face it by ourselves. And so we cling to hope and we hold on to faith in the midst of all that we may be walking through. As a reminder to all of us, faith is defined in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, when it says this, now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Faith is a confidence, not in what we have, but in what we hope for. It's an assurance, not of what we can see with our eyes, but what is yet unseen. We long for it, but that's where faith comes into play. That at the end of our humanity, at the end of our means, at the end of our ability, we step out in, in faith, we step out to hope for those things that we can't yet see. And so for all of us, when we recognize that bad things do happen, we've experienced that. We've seen people experience that. We're brokenhearted by the events of this last 24 hours. 
Let me just remind all of us that we have no promise that every prayer we pray will be answered. But we do have a promise of his presence, that he'll be with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We do have an assurance of his comfort when we mourn and when we grieve. And we do have a reminder of his nearness to us when we're brokenhearted. And I'm so thankful for that. But can I also say to you that for me, as I wrestle with all of this, it's not, it's not resolved. It's this lifelong journey of wrestling with the kinds of things we're walking through. I, I, I genuinely believe that God is a healer. I genuinely believe that God is a God who answers our prayers. I don't just say that. I'm not trying to say that so that you think I'm some kind of uh, high and mighty faith filled. No, I, I, I wrestle with the same things you wrestle with. But can I, just, can I just say to you that when I was praying last night in that hospital room, I was praying full of confidence and faith that God could do a miracle. Even though there have been times, even in my own life personally, where my prayers didn't get answered the way that I hoped they would. And so the next time that I'm in a moment like that, I believe. I'm asking God to help me. I'm asking God to grow my faith and my confidence in who he is, that he will heal, that he will restore, that he will redeem, because I believe that he can. That's what a life built on faith looks like, and that's what I'm striving to be every single day as I move forward in this journey, in this relationship, this walk with him. And that's my prayer for you. We believe in the miraculous, and I'm still believing that we're going to hear incredible testimonies of this month-long journey of looking at miracles. And I hope that you pray with a confidence to a God that can meet you at your place of need. But I also recognize that sometimes those prayers don't get answered the way we hope. And when they don't, and we're brokenhearted, that that's okay. And he promises to be close. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you hear us. I thank you, God, that in the midst of our heartache and our tra in the tragedies that we see and face, that God, you are so close. And God, that's the only thing that helps us to make it another day. God, I pray right now for the Lee family. I pray for Jesse. Got a husband who lost his wife far too young. God, I pray that in some way you would just continue to capture his heart, draw him close to you, let him feel the comfort that only comes from you and the peace that passes all understanding and that it would guard his heart and his mind in the days ahead. God, I pray for three-year-old William. God, I don't understand. I pray for now nine-day-old Amelia. God, I don't understand. I cannot reconcile how this is in any way gonna work out for any good and for your glory. God, I can't. But Lord, I pray that you would, you would be with these children and that they would be surrounded, as I know they are, by a loving family, by friends, by a church family that would invest in them and empower them as they chase after you. God, capture their heart at such a young age. God, I pray for the Lee family. God, I pray for the White family. I pray for Richard and for Pam who have lost a child. That's not the way this is supposed to work. And so, God, I pray for a mom and dad who are brokenhearted today. God, I pray for Brandon and for Aaron and for Alexis. God, I pray they've lost a sister. And God, I pray for their families. God, I pray that you would be with them and comfort them in the days ahead. I pray for our church family and the community of people that that Brianna's life touched. God, there, there's a lot of brokenheartedness. There's a lot of pain and questioning. God, would you, would you walk with us? Would you be close to us? And God, I pray for every single one of us when we come to moments like this and we're reminded that heartache and tragedy and pain is real in this present circumstance, that God, we would cling to the hope that's available to us through Jesus Christ. And that God, our faith would grow, not because of our own ability, not because you've ever answered every prayer we've ever prayed in the way we hope it's been answered, but God, that we would cling to faith because it's an assurance and a hope in what we long for. And so God, give us the faith to continue to pray for the miraculous every single time we're confronted with the need for you to intervene. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you so much. God bless.
praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.